Welcome to Y Lab, the makerspace located in the basement workshops of the historic David Dunlap Observatory in Richmond Hill, Ontario, Canada, and where you can trick your friends into visiting a grubby makerspace by telling them you're visiting Downton Abbey. This is lesson 20, on-air protocol. It's an easy section relative to some of the more technical ones, so go for 95% on the quiz so that you can take it easier on the tougher sections. Priorities for being on air. Number one is safety. Number two, we'll say it again and again because it's important for the test, is manners. So emergency communications always have the priority. As you'll see in a lot of the sections in this training, emergency communications even allows you to break rules. After that, good manners take priority. So when you're on the air, don't blabber away. Keep it short. Leave breaks for other people to talk. And also for emergencies. Typically, when one person is transmitting, they're modulating the signal, it's called, and other people can't transmit. So short sentences. Stop and listen to see if somebody else needs to come in. So... As soon as you're on the air, before you say anything, stop five to ten seconds. You change to a frequency. Is anybody else on there? Now, once you're on there, you generally have priority. But of course, even with priority, you take breaks, stop the breeze, stop transmitting. If another group comes on and said they've scheduled something, we give them priority. You know, they've already put out the messages, the notices. So back off. And then finally, no swearing, no bad language. That is not allowed on amateur radio. So let's go through some listening tricks. Okay? There's ways of testing on a frequency without transmitting and with nobody to respond. So a lot of times, particularly when you're new, you'll be trying to get on air and you tend to listen for a contact and you want to hear something back, but a lot of times there's nobody there to talk to. So first thing you can do to check out your radio is look in some radio guides. Search online for beacons, license stations that are not on hand bands, but close, and other automated transmitters. Uh, there's time transmitters. There's all kinds of things out there. And remember, we talk about hand bands. So your radio can transmit in a lot more frequencies than you're allowed to in the amateur radio spectrum. So you'll have a band if you look and say, uh, as an example, on the 10 meter band, you're only allowed to go up or go down to 28 megahertz. Your radio can actually go below that. So there are broadcast transmitters on frequencies slightly outside. And that gives you something to at least test your antenna to see if you're receiving properly. Okay. If you have a directional antenna, look for transmitters that are in specific locations. So if you've got a Yagi that you can steer, um, point it to somewhere where you know has a, a transmitter that's broadcasting. And remember, we cover this. The azimuthal map puts you at the center of the world. There are websites for this where you can put out, uh, you can pre create a map based on where you are and you'll know what direction for any point in the world you want to, uh, you want to reach. Okay. Manners, again, lowest power, please. You're not trying to prove anything. You're not trying to blast everybody off the air. Okay. Using more power than necessary means that you're annoying people farther away who don't need to hear you, you know, particularly if you're starting a conversation with somebody. It also might mean you're blocking emergency requests because you're tying up the frequency in a wider area. And generally, the more power you have, the more interference you're causing. So use the conversation to test and drop to the appropriate level. Now, Something you got to remember, uh, the ratios here, or the scale of the um, transmission power that, remember in the intro material we said is measured in dB, 
and that's relative. Okay, so it's always relative to what you're receiving. And when you have a transmitter that's capable of a thousand watts and more of power, but you might only need uh, one or two watts to reach somebody close or five, ten watts to get some pretty reasonable distance, uh, we're talking about big relative multiples, you know, being able to go up a hundred times in power or the converse, go down a hundred times in power and still reach the person. So for the conversation, we have the RST codes. And uh, this is how you communicate the signal. So normally we're just using two of the values, the R, the readability, and S, the strength. If we're on Morse or CW, as we call it, uh, then you've got a third parameter, the tone. So you'll hear people on the air saying, oh, I'm hearing you 5-9, or I'm hearing you 3-7. So the first one is readability. How well can you understand the person? Okay, can you hear them? Um, uh, is it clear? Is there a lot of hiss? So it's pretty much a judgment call, you know, somewhere on the scale of one to five. And then there's the signal strength where you're trying to tell them how big, how strong is the signal uh, you're receiving. Uh, so if you're hearing it loud and clear, you know, you tell them it's a, a five nine. Uh, if it's a little, you're hearing them clear, but it's weak, you'll say, you know, a four or a five and a, a strength of five. Ideally, you're using your S meter. So a lot of radios have this. The newer digital ones, the smaller handhelds, they just, you know, have a crappy five little LED sliding back and forth, just like your cell phone. It doesn't really mean anything. Uh, well, depending on the radio, it might, but a lot of them, it's a bit of a joke. Uh, the S meter on the older radios usually go S0 to S9, and S9 is considered the ideal transmit level. Uh, then it goes above S9, and so we'll be telling you more about that. Uh, so if somebody's transmitting and you're receiving above S9, you're going to tell them to tone it down. And that S meter is pretty coarse. Uh, so it's got the nine levels, and going up by one level on the S meter means a jump of four times in the transmission power. So uh, there's lots and lots of room to move up and down in your power level, uh, and some of that will be dependent on your radio, of course. Okay, another part of manners. Test your equipment first before you start transmitting over the air. Now, when you're punching out high power, that power needs somewhere to go. Uh, so you don't transmit on a, a higher power radio without an antenna or a dummy load. A dummy load is just a really big resistor. It's usually got cooling fins, so it can take a lot of power. It can take that thousand watts of power coming out of your radio. It'll absorb that. And so it allows you to test your equipment, test the different pieces in the chain without annoying others with an actual transmission. So remember, it's a safety thing because you shouldn't be transmitting without an antenna or a load on there. And it allows you to test stuff without bothering the rest of the world. And remember, you know, big power, you can reach around the world and bother a lot of people. Next part of manners, sharing the frequency. So these are amateur frequencies. You don't own squat. Everyone else has equal rights to the frequencies. Now, there is kind of an exception to that, where uh, radio clubs put up um, repeaters, and so generally they will own those frequencies for that geographic area. But even then, uh, usually everybody's allowed to use those repeaters. Okay. So general rule, the priority is whoever was there first, but don't be a jerk. Okay. Don't hog the frequency. If there's a meeting, give it up. Offer to move to another frequency. Okay. And if you're the one running a group at a scheduled time and somebody else is on the frequency, it's not rude to ask the current users to relinquish. 
as long as you're not rude about it, of course. And if they're really stubborn about it, you know, uh, well, just move on. Uh, agree with everybody else on your net that you're going to move uh, to an offset frequency from where the meeting was scheduled. Now the band plan. These are the frequencies for radio amateurs. Uh, we could start showing up a bunch of slides here about it, but really, uh, you know, our goal is to make it as simple as possible to get through the test, and we will have other videos, and there are lots of videos on using the band plans. So the thing you have to remember is it's a list of frequencies that you are allowed as an amateur radio operator. Now, within each frequency set, so remember they'll talk about uh, 10 meter, or they'll talk about the 10 meter band, which is around 10 megahertz. Uh, we'll cover some of those calculations and stuff in other sections, and we talk about it in the intro. Uh, so in each band, or within each frequency band, you've got recommended or restricted usage types. And so some bands, parts of bands, are, say, restricted to Morse. Or by convention, it's a certain type of modulation, FM, upper side band, lower side band, things like that. And so you should have your band plan handy. And uh, the rack publishes a really nice one that you can put up as a single page. Now, transmission char characteristics of the bands. The lower the frequency, the better distance you get. So generally, uh, actually not generally, of course, the lower frequencies need less power to make distance and will get you more distance. Different frequencies have propagation features. So depending on the frequency, it will bounce off of the sky. And that's how radio signals get around the world. They're actually bouncing up and down repeatedly to get around the planet. They're not going through planet Earth. Um, and those features can change at the time of day. So, for instance, if you've ever used an AM radio at night, especially the older ones with the dial, you find that uh, after dark in the evening, you're catching signals from way farther away than you would during the day. And that's because the conditions of the atmosphere at night work well to bounce AM signals uh, from farther away into your area. Okay. Then some other transmission characteristics. Higher frequencies, they'll go through walls. They're great for local communication. So if you think of UHF and VHF, uh, which are the frequencies you're allowed to use with just with, if you just have the basic license, uh, those are the same frequencies used for TV and radio. And you don't have to put your antenna outside. You'll get better reception, of course. You can put one high up. But your radio works inside the house. Your TV works inside the house. Uh, these signals work great for local communications. They're at the higher frequencies, but they don't go far. That's why we can have channel 5 in one city and channel 5 on the same frequency in another city. They don't have a lot of range. Next, call signs. Your call sign is very important. You earn your call sign by getting your amateur radio license. And you always have to identify yourself in the initial message. Just say it once. So you're getting on air. Uh, on HF, you're going CQ, CQ, which means you want to make a contact. And you're saying your call sign, say VA3ABC. And you just say it once. If you know who you're trying to communicate with, use their call sign. Say it once or twice. CQ, CQ, Victor Alpha 3 ABC, looking for Victor Alpha 3 DEF. Use the phonetic alphabet if the signal quality is poor. And generally, it's great to use the phonetic alphabet. So if I'm on CQ again, it's CQ, CQ. This is Victor Alpha 3 Alpha Bravo Charlie. And you can repeat it again at the end. Now, uh, again, we talked about you have to say it, your call sign, when you start the communication. You also have to re-identify yourself at least every 30 minutes. This is a federal rule of the communications. 
So think of that interval as your basic TV show, where on uh, the TV they're identifying themselves. This is station identification. This is, uh, you know, whatever whatever identifier they have on the radio station or the TV set. So every 30 seconds, every 30 minutes, sorry, you need to re-identify yourself. Code words. Radio people love using code words. So a lot of these were developed way back in the age of Morse code to reduce the amount of keying. You know, we think of SOS in general. Okay? But we tend to try and use them as little as possible. One of the more fundamental ones, particularly for the HF people, is the Q codes. And so the Q codes are things like QRH, what's your location? So uh, on Morse, it'll be QRH question mark, and you would respond QRH Thornhill. Uh, on HF, when you're using voice, uh, they'll say, what's your QRH? You know, just as short to say, what's your location? But people use these codes. And you'll say my QRH or just I'm in Thornhill. And then there are number codes that uh, apparently came out of the railroads. And you'll hear people wrapping up with 73. And that's the number code for best regards. Very common one. Repeater versus phone or direct communication. Now, this generally applies to the uh, what people call the FM or the UHF and VHF frequencies that are above 30 megahertz in the range that people with uh, only their basic license are allowed to use. So why do clubs set up repeaters? Well, you can use a small radio locally on these frequencies, UHF, VHF. Uh, and again, you know, these frequencies are great. You can receive them in your house, transmit through walls in your car and stuff like that. Uh, it's the same frequency bands as TV and radio. But those signals have a limited range. Again, it's higher power, uh, higher frequency, so they just don't go as far. A repeater will relay your signal to an offset frequency. So uh, frequency slightly off from the one you're transmitting on. And in some cases, uh, they can actually retransmit from the UHF frequencies to the longer range HF frequencies. But be careful there. If you don't have your basic with honors license or your basic license with your Morse or your advanced license, you are not allowed to transmit on those HF frequencies, uh, even if it's through a repeater. And something that's not on the test and not in a lot of the training material is that repeaters can be hooked up to the internet to talk to other repeaters around the world. And as long as they're just using UHF, VHF frequencies, even with your basic with honors license, or your, your sorry, your basic license, that gives you the capability to communicate around the world with just a little handheld radio. So the repeater works by using a separate frequency for transmit and receive. The frequency they advertise, the primary frequency, is the receive frequency where you're listening. When you transmit, you're transmitting at the different frequency. Now, don't worry about twiddling with knobs to switch between the transmit and receive uh, frequencies. Every modern radio going back for decades that operates on the UHF, VHF frequency, including the handhelds, have the ability to automatically configure this. So you set up a repeater and you say it's going to be on this frequency and here's the offset. And even your cheap little handheld handles that beautifully. Now it has to be on the separate transmit and receive frequencies because when it retransmits, it's doing it at the same time. It's not delaying it. So if it was retransmitting at the same time on the same frequency, you would be interfering with yourself. So the transmit and receive frequencies have an offset. Uh, as far as the test goes, think of it as 600 kilohertz. Uh, but generally, it depends on the band you're using. It'll either be 600 kilohertz or 5 megahertz. So for the test, again, just worry about 600 kilohertz. Think 6, 6 for transmit.
Now, if you're going to have a long conversation, do you want to be in the repeater? The repeaters are generally a shared resource. So you can actually go to the transmit frequency, set up your radio for it, and listen when that other person is transmitting. If you can hear them and you're, you know, just you're going to have a long conversation with that person, um, you can move off the repeater because you know that, hey, I'm hearing their direct transmission. Okay, so again, it's that manners rule. If you can hear them on the transmission, on their transmission, then go off to a different frequency. Not the transmit frequency, because that's being used by the repeater. Uh, go off to the transmit frequency, agree to go to a different frequency, and hold your conversation there in simplex. Uh, this may sound esoteric, but there are a few questions in the test about this stuff. Now, while the repeaters are generally free for all when the uh, clubs put them up, uh, they will usually control access with a CTCSS signal. This is an inaudible signal. You can't hear it. And again, all the radios support it. It's not encryption or anything like that. And the repeater looks for this signal. The reason it looks for it is there can be all kinds of random signals going on over the air, random transmissions. And so those transmissions will not be repeated because they don't have the CTCSS signal. So your radio, you set it up. Uh, what's the offset frequency? What's the CTCSS signal? And you're now talking to repeater. Repeaters also have a timeout feature in case you won't shut up. So they will actually stop retransmitting if there is no break in your transmission. Uh, you will often hear people uh, on a repeater if they've got a really long sentence. It may not be that long, but they're just being careful and respective of everybody. And uh, they will stop and say, breaking for a second, you hear the little <laughs> where they're stopping transmitting. And so that uh, takes care of the timeout feature. It also gives a little break in case somebody else needs to come on or there's an emergency transmission. So it's generally <laughs> good practice, and uh, you will hear people saying that. And so there's a good, you know, two good reasons for it. One is the repeater timeout. The other one is the good manners. Now, on the repeater, you want to avoid using code words. Stick with plain English words. Okay. But always use your call sign. So you can say, this is VA3ME listening. Okay? You can say, this is VA3ME calling VE3U. You can say, what is your location? You will hear amateur operators using the Q signals and stuff like that, or the Q signs but it's generally considered bad practice on the repeater. If you are talking direct, or as we call it, phone, without using the repeater, use the code word sparingly. So, you know, CQ, 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 this is VA3ME, or CQ, CQ, calling CQ, this is VA3ME, Victor Alpha 3, Mike Echo. You know, say it phonetically. It might be scratchy. You don't know how well people are receiving it, and uh, by you know, calling out your call sign phonetically, somebody will be able to hear who it is. Okay, uh, they'll say, "What's your QTH?" My QTH is Richmond Hill, Ontario. But again, use the code words when you're on phone or you know direct communication as opposed to the repeater. Now, as a last slide for this section, we're going to get into some more esoteric stuff. So we talk about UHF, VHF up there as the FM frequencies. Uh, down in the HF range, we're generally on AM or a variant of AM called single sideband or SSB. And you'll see this on the big HF radios. Okay. So the physics of this on the right um, is you see the second picture there, full AM modulation. At the signal level, 
when you're transmitting AM, what you're seeing is this spike in the middle at the center frequency where you're transmitting and a lobe on each side of that. Now, here's an interesting thing about that. You know, that's transmit spike in the middle and the two lobes, uh, it's overkill. We can actually filter out the center spike and we can filter out one of the sidebands and your voice, all the information in your voice is carried on the remaining sideband. And so to save bandwidth, to make things clearer, the radios will transmit in one of three ways. They can transmit AM, where you have the center spike and the two lobes, or it can transmit on upper sideband or lower sideband. And so makes things clear, and then all the radios will recreate the full signal using the lower lobe or the higher lobe. So either one works, but the rule is generally if you're below 10 megahertz, use lower sideband. If you're above 10 megahertz, use the upper sideband. So to help you remember this, 10 megahertz, put a net that's 10 backwards between LSB and USB. So 10, 10 megahertz is the frequency where uh, you draw the line between lower sideband and upper sideband. Okay. Now, as an exercise, translate the above to wavelength. Or don't do that exercise now if you haven't covered that math yet, since you may be taking the test out of order. Okay. And again, on these frequencies, if the frequency is occupied, you need to move up or down by three kilohertz of separation so you're not interfering with somebody else. So there are lots of good references for this. We didn't go through all the Q signals and things like that. Uh, there's a lot more you need to know about your first contact. And so go to these pages uh, to get more information on these and more detailed information. Again, our goal here is to get you through the test. Now jump to quiz 20. Uh, the links from this presentation are in the comments section below. And again, this is one of the easier sections, so work it until you get that 95% accuracy. Again, we're Y Lab, the makerspace located in the David Dunlap Observatory. You can find us at https colon slash slash ylab.ca. And if you put some comments down below, uh, hey, maybe we'll get in, uh, get around to reviewing them and posting them up.